In Japan's Shizuoka Prefecture, many people believed that a child born on New Year's Day will meet only one of two fates. It will either turn out to be a complete failure in life or go on to be a great hero, but nothing in between. For Shimizu no Chirocho, it seemed like he would end up on the negative end of the spectrum. Instead, he managed to turn his life around and did not just become a hero, but one of Japan's and the Yakuza's biggest folk heroes ever, with dozens of books and countless movies about his life produced even far beyond his death. In this video, we will explore the life of Chirocho. From birth to rebellious adolescence, from gangster to businessman, from completely transforming his hometown to his eventual death and beyond. This is the story of Shimizu no Chirocho, the legendary Yakuza boss. The legend known as Shimizu no Chirocho was born under the name Yamamoto Chogoro and was the third son of a sailor from Japan's Shizuoka prefecture. To be more precise, his home was the port town of Shimizu, situated along Tokaido Road, one of the historically most important routes in the country. Mount Fuji isn't far from there either, you can get a really nice view of Japan's tallest mountain there. Overall, it does seem like the perfect birthplace for a Japanese folk legend, doesn't it? even more fitting might be Chirocho's date of birth. According to the legend, he was born on New Year's Day of 1820. For the people of the area, this date held a certain significance. It was said that children born on New Year's Day would either end up a complete failure or go on to become great heroes. Chirocho being born on a fateful day like this would be almost poetic, but what the legend claims has to be taken with a huge grain of salt. Official records state that he was born on February 14th instead. Maybe his admirers thought that a Yakuza legend being born on Valentine's Day wasn't cool enough or something. Chirocho's father chose to have his son adopted at a young age and put him under the care of his uncle, a wealthy rice merchant. It's also at this point that Chirocho received his name. Remember that he was born by the name Chogoro? Chirocho combines his uncle's name, Chirohachi, with Chogoro. Chirocho is basically an abbreviation of Chirohachi's Chogoro. Following the adoption, Chirocho would prove to be very difficult to raise. He and his uncle would constantly get into arguments. At some point, Chirocho was passed on to yet another uncle, who kept him around for around 6 years, but ultimately sent him back in 1835. It was somewhere around this point that Chirocho decided to settle down a bit and became a rice merchant himself. The slight change of character came at exactly the right time. Just a year later, his uncle would pass away and Chirocho inherited the business. While he still had kind of a bad temper, he did a decent enough job at succeeding his uncle. And it looked like Chirocho was going to be a rice merchant for the rest of his life. That was until one fateful day in 1839, when a wandering monk showed up at his doorstep. The monk brought with him a shocking prediction. Chirocho would not live to see his 26th birthday. Chirocho took the monk's prediction very, very seriously and decided that if he only had a couple years left, he might as well spend his short time on earth whoring around while drinking and gambling as much as he possibly could. Some might say he was here for a good time, not a long time. While enjoying what he thought would be his final years, he also became involved with gamblers for the first time. These groups of gamblers, or bakuto in Japanese, were one of the precursors to the modern Yakuza and had spread all across Japan by the 19th century. Shimizu was home to a bakuto group that was especially influential, not only in their own town, but also across multiple places along the aforementioned Tokaido Road. Now, they were also able to count among their members one of the Yakuza's future greats, Chirocho of Shimizu, or Shimizu no Chirocho. Shimizu 
Shortly after Chirocho joined the group of gamblers from Shimizu, he experienced yet another life-changing event. In March of 1842, he was on his way home from a night of gambling and drinking, something that had become routine for him at this point. But this time, the drunken Chirocho would be confronted and attacked by three local thugs, which caused some serious injuries that he barely survived. On the brink of death, Chirocho swore to never drink and to never become an easy target for bandits again. Three months later, he killed someone for the first time in his life after getting into yet another fight, this time with a local gambler. Chirocho had enough, he had to leave his current life behind. He packed his bags, left his wife, entrusted the business to his sister and her husband, and traveled through Japan for the next three years. On his travels, Chirocho managed to grow as a person, and more importantly, as a gangster, learning about business, becoming proficient with the sword, and establishing some very important and influential friendships along the way. He gained lots of recognition as a fighter, a mediator, and as a leader. All of these newfound skills became very important for Chirocho when he returned to Shimizu in 1845. When he managed to settle a violent dispute between two rivaling Shimizu gang bosses, more and more locals became aware of Chirocho's strength and leadership skills. He quickly realized that now was the perfect opportunity to take the next step as a Yakuza. Chirocho became the boss of his own gang. Gamblers and all of those who wanted to be gamblers wasted no time in joining his newly created crime family. However, Chirocho did not simply gather a group of Bakuto. He was also joined by construction workers, unemployed ex-samurai, and of course, streetwise brawlers, cut from the same cloth as Chirocho himself. In a way, he assembled a crew that could be considered the blueprint of the modern Yakuza gang. The local police, however, were not only aware of the power that Chirocho was quickly gaining, they also knew about his violent, criminal past. With the law on his heels, Chirocho was constantly on the run, never settling in one place, while also fighting rival gangs from Shimizu and its surrounding areas, greatly expanding his following while doing so. Over the next two decades, membership numbers of his gang rose to around 600 men. This would be quite a big gang, even by today's standards. But in 1866, Chirocho and his massive crime syndicate were truly a force to be reckoned with. They managed to control around eight different places, from Tokyo's Fuji River to the Oi River near Kyoto. While being chased by the police, Chirocho's gang often ended up doing their job. Police officers along the Tokaido Road and its countless cities were known to be incredibly corrupt and, frankly, pretty bad at actually enforcing the law. Many folktales about Chirocho and his men exist from this time, portraying them as selfless heroes who defended the Japanese citizens against dishonorable gamblers, violent thieves, samurai who lost their sense of honor, and their evil lords. You know, classic Yakuza stuff. These heroic tales, accurate or not, surely didn't find a large audience with Japanese citizens without a good reason. Japan was going through some truly turbulent times in the mid-1800s. Chirocho was not only there to witness his country changing rapidly, he was also there to massively profit from it. By the early 1850s, the Tokugawa shogunate, which had ruled Japan and closed its borders for the rest of the world for over 200 years at that point, started to show some cracks. Japanese nobles and wealthy merchants alike wanted more power, more money and more influence and consequently demanded change. Foreign countries as well seemingly had enough of Japan shutting itself off from the rest of the world, which was symbolized by the arrival of Commodore Perry accompanied by a fleet of US Navy ships in 1853. When it became clear that Japan would open its borders to the world, it also became clear that the country itself would change a lot, both culturally and, most importantly, politically. Consequently, two opposing groups of supporters emerged those who continued to support a military government led by the shogunate, and those who wanted to see the emperor as head of state. At that point, the emperor had merely a symbolic role, but no real political influence. 
Supporters of the Emperor mainly consisted of those who were enraged by the Shogunate's failure to keep foreigners out of Japan. They were sure that the Emperor would be able to keep Japan as it is and with that peaceful and prosperous. For Chirocho, there was a lot at stake here. If he sided with the right people during this turning point in Japanese history, he could profit from it greatly and become even more powerful than he already was. He had to go back to his roots as a gambler, roll the dice and hope he'll end up on the winning side. Chirocho chose to support the Emperor and with him all the powerful people who wanted to see him as the ruler of the land of the rising sun. Soon enough, it was clear that he had made the right choice. On November 9th, 1867, Emperor Meiji took over the duty of leading Japan and did the exact opposite of what his supporters expected from him. Opening Japan's doors to the world wider than ever before, citizens were now either very excited or very afraid of what would happen next. As for Chirocho, there is no doubt that he must have been incredibly excited about the future, and rightfully so. Among his new allies were, among others, the first governor of Shizuoka, his home prefecture, and the general of the imperial army. In 1868, the government officially made Chirocho a police officer in his hometown, pardoned all of his past crimes, and even gave him the power to oversee the harbor of Shimizu. Chirocho had achieved what, even today, every Yakuza boss dreams of. He turned a life of crime into that of a legitimate businessman. At heart, he was still a gangster, but he quickly learned how to solve problems without the use of violence and bloodshed. He further elevated his legend status when he started multiple very important development projects throughout Shizuoka. Chirocho was responsible for establishing one of Japan's first English schools, saying, young people from now on must know English. He also took care of rebuilding Shimizu's Teshuchi Temple, helped victims of fires around the city, provided homeless samurai with a home, and even brought a well-educated doctor from Tokyo to Shimizu. When a clash of imperial and shogunate ships occurred in 1868, Chirocho arranged and paid for the funeral of seven sailors who lost their lives during the short conflict, including shogunate sailors. Chirocho was quoted as saying, whether a person was pro or anti-shogunate is irrelevant after death. The dead are Buddha. He also enlisted the help of several prisoners and made sure that land surrounding Mount Fuji was fit for farming, greatly improving local agriculture and even setting up multiple Shinto shrines in the area. If you ever visit a place near Mount Fuji, there is a good chance that you'll come by a shrine that was commissioned by Chirocho. Despite all of these great services to the community, Chirocho just couldn't completely let go of his criminal past and was still involved with gambling on the side. When the imperial police arrested multiple people involved in illegal gambling, Chirocho was among those who received a prison sentence. Originally, he was supposed to spend seven years behind bars, but thanks to his connections, he was able to get out of jail after not even two years. Chirocho was now 66 years old, and yet, he never had a biological child who could follow in his footsteps. The closest thing to an actual son that he had was Yamamoto Goro, whose father was killed during the Japanese Civil War of the 1860s. Goro was adopted by Chirocho and stayed with him for around 10 years. It was actually Goro's reports and vivid descriptions of his adoptive father that made Chirocho a legend well beyond Shizuoka Prefecture. Goro himself though would stay away from the Yakuza lifestyle and would eventually become a Buddhist monk. When Chirocho approached his final years, he had a couple more projects on his hands. The biggest and most important of which was the expansion of the port of Shimizu. The effects of Chiricho's work can still be felt to this day. The harbor of Shimizu today is not only an international trade port, it also connects many important international ports and serves as an employer for many people of Shizuoka Prefecture. In 1893, Shimizu no Chirocho passed away at the age of 73. His funeral was a testament to his popularity, with over 8,000 people showing up to mourn his death. Chirocho was buried at Bain Senchi Temple in Shizuoka, 
a place that still welcomes countless visitors who come to pay their respects to the man who has done so much to develop their area. As popular as Chirocho was when he died, his real legacy developed after he passed away. The inspiring story of the useless gambler from Shimizu, who made it big, started resonating with the public over the next few decades. His life story inspired dozens of books, and when Japan first started dipping its toes into the waters of the film industry, the story of Shimizu no Chirocho became an inspiration for movie directors as well. It is estimated that more than a hundred movies about Chirocho exist in total. The earliest known Chirocho movie dates back to 1911, when the movie industry in general was still in its infancy. This movie from 1911 saw Chirocho portrayed by Onoe Matsunosuke, who would go on to be Japanese cinema's first superstar, appearing in over a thousand movies throughout his career. Sadly, like many other movies from this time period, it is considered to be lost media. 1959's Chirocho Fuji is probably the most popular movie made about Shimizu no Chirocho. It featured many well-known actors of the time period, creating the ultimate Chirocho movie, at least according to its IMDb page. While there are many historical figures who had movies made about them, Chirocho was immortalized by his own hometown in a much more meaningful way. Near the port of Shimizu, which Chirocho had such a huge influence on, you can find Chirocho Street, named in honor of the legendary Yakuza boss. Not only that, but not far from Chirocho Street, there is a museum dedicated to him. The building itself is a reconstruction of Suehiro Inn, which was once owned by Chirocho himself and was also the place where he passed away. The reconstruction itself was done with materials from the Meiji era. How many gang bosses do you know that have their own darn museum and street? Two famous statues depicting Chirocho also exist. One at the aforementioned Teshuchi temple that he helped rebuild, the second one at his burial place. Some people believe that his bronze statue is actually a talisman which allows you to win at gambling games. This is a bit of a problem since many visitors go there simply to break off a piece of the statue which they can bring with them for good luck. While I just spent quite some time depicting Chirocho as a hero, I also have to mention that a lot of information about him has to be taken with a grain of salt. Large parts of his biography come from many different sources and spread through word of mouth, which inevitably brings with it at least a few discrepancies. Remember that even his real date of birth was a bit of a mystery. Additionally, some information that portrayed Shimizu no Chirocho in a less flattering way came to light occasionally. One example was a 1975 article by the Asahi Shimbun, one of Japan's oldest and biggest newspapers. In an article with the snappy title, Robin Hood of Shimizu was nothing but a thug, some old documents from a town near Shimizu were revealed. In these documents, it was claimed that Chirocho, instead of respectfully helping the farmers of the area, oppressed and controlled them through nothing but violence and intimidation. Of course, a lot of Chirocho's charitable work cannot be discredited. But considering his criminal and violent past, I don't exactly doubt that he was at least capable of things like intimidation and oppression. Either way, the most positive effect that Shimizu no Chirocho had on people was undoubtedly that of actually being a folk hero. His story tells people that no matter how bad your situation might be, even if you're a good-for-nothing, violent drinker and gambler, you can turn yourself into a respectable person, if you put in enough work to do so. As David E. Kaplan stated in his book Yakuza – Japan's Criminal Underworld, like most of the world's great outlaws, Chirocho is best remembered through legend, not history. I would like to give a quick shout out to one of my viewers, Hadenormous, who gave me the idea for making this video. Do you have any suggestions for a future video yourself? Tell me in the comments. Also, make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Either way, thank you so much for watching. Sayonara.